Let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, 
and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We begin our reading at chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what a peroration is? Well, I'll give you an example. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. John F. Kennedy. I guess I'm thinking back to in school terms, because it's the first week back uh, this week, peroration, the concluding part of a speech, typically intended to inspire enthusiasm in the audience. For example, using the word in a sentence, Robert again invoked the theme in an emotional peroration, peroration. Can't even say the word. Jesus comes to the end of his most famous peroration, the Sermon on the Mount. And like any good communicator, he wants to impress on his audience the importance of his words, so he makes a really strong final point 
to challenge us. What does Jesus say? Well, let's pray first. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, Matthew chapter 7 records Jesus ending the Sermon on the Mount with a clear set of illustrations, teachings, and challenges. And so he paints four vivid contrasts between true and false to conclude his famous sermon. We will discover that it's going to take real concentration to do what he's asking. In other words, his followers have to use their minds, their hearts, and their wills if they're going to make a go of it. The warnings come in quick succession, and the illustrations almost speak for themselves. But as many of us have discovered, obvious things are not always easy to do. Let's spell out the challenge right away. What we're seeing are the words of Jesus here in Matthew chapter 7. And in the eyes of Jesus, there's no good reason for not doing what he said to do. Why? Because Jesus only tells us to do what is the very best. As one of my favorite authors points out, in one situation, Jesus asked his disciples, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? He says this, Just try picturing yourself standing before the Lord of the universe, explaining why you did not do what he said was best. Now, of course, there are times in which we make quick decisions or we're misguided. So we must trust the Lord's grace and forgiveness. But it will not do as a general posture in a life of faith in Jesus. Jesus has actually made for us a way through. So let's take a closer look at the passage. True discipleship, basically, is a minority position, a matter of deliberately opting out from the mainstream, but it is a matter, of course, of life and death. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. So it, it poses the very obvious question. Have you gone through the gate? Are you on the road to eternal life? These are very, very important questions. And you cannot get on the road unless you go through the turnstiles. They're narrow. No room for excess baggage. And notice how Jesus challenges us to decide. There's no comfortable middle road. I wish it was otherwise. In the Gospels, following Jesus meant leaving behind your comfort zone. It means being on the road that starts off narrow, but opens up, of course, into the life of heaven. Or the opposite. Staying on the broad road of self-centeredness and, unfortunately, ultimate destruction. It is not a very popular message. So no wonder Jesus warns against false prophets who would give you a message to suit people's fancy. But first, what is a prophet? A prophet is not just someone who foretells the future, but is speaking for God. Thus says the Lord. The Bible is a book of prophecy. Thus says the Lord. In some way, what you're hearing right now is prophetic, in that it is my desire to speak for God through his word in the scriptures. Unfortunately, Jesus says that there are some false prophets. And I think it's fair to say that we live in an age where false prophecy is alive and well. 
And the trouble with false prophets is, is of course, that they seem very nice, very reasonable, and very trustworthy at first. The wolf at grandma's house dressed up to disguise his claws and teeth to fool Little Red Riding Hood. And nowadays it can be very difficult to discern what is good teaching from bad because false prophets often use all the right words, maybe even religious words, to destroy the truth. I believe that it's what makes the narrow road so difficult to find sometimes. It is the existence of numerous false prophets, teachers, or maybe even motivational speakers who have their own formula for the good of humanity. In the days of Jesus, they cried out from the housetops and in the streets, and in our own time, from the pages of newspapers, television, and the media perhaps even some churches. And I'll give you an example from today of what I would consider a false prophetic message. People are basically good. We've all heard it, maybe even believed it, but that is not a biblical truth. In fact, it is the opposite in the scriptures. Quote, people are basically good seems like a rather trivial belief, but let me assure you, if this is a person's starting point, they will see no need for the cross of Jesus Christ. A few other false messages. It doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere. All religions are alike. Jesus preached a message of love and tolerance. And here's one that is very current. Love is love. Love is love suggests that love is self-defining, that it cannot be qualified and simply is. This would make love somehow self-existent and foundational, something like love is what it is and you cannot question it. Love, of course, is certainly a primal and powerful reality, but self-defining, it is not. All things, all love, has to be looked through the biblical lens. And so Jesus warns his followers that the most dangerous characteristic of all of these false prophets is that their teaching often appears at first sight to be very close to the truth or have some elements of truth in it. False prophets present themselves as insiders in sheep's clothing but their intention is destructive, ferocious wolves. So not all alleged prophecy is to be taken at face value. It must be tested. But how can you tell if you are being a true prophet? Simple, says Jesus, by the fruit you produce in your life. Now, in the Old Testament, the test for true and false prophets was wait and see. If the prophet tells you something is going to happen, you will discover whether they're really speaking for God by seeing whether it happens or not. Jesus has a more graphic and perhaps quicker method of detection. Look at the life of the person who is offering you advice. Think of it like a tree. Think of it like a fruit. Can you see healthy fruit on it? Can you see other people being generally nourished by it in a godly way? True fruit is not so much about flashy displays, but about real character change and formation. What counts is what is going on deep in a person's life, a godly life reflecting the character of Jesus Christ. I cannot tell you how many people I thought were really gifted, they were anointed, only to be later on disappointed and hurt when they fall into great sin or rebellion. It nullifies what they said. It makes the church look really bad. The only real superstar, of course, is Jesus. But you and I, have a very large responsibility to have our lives reflect 
the character of Jesus Christ, superstar. This character is much more than even the outer experiences, of course, the, the, the appearances. It has to go very deep in our hearts. Have you ever bitten into a piece of fruit and you thought it was going to be so delicious because it looks so good, only discover it's not ripe, or worse, it's rotten inside? What is inside our lives, what is in our heart, is so vitally, vitally important. And so the test is not the prophet's profession, but their fruit. The meaning of fruit is not spelled out here, but the metaphor occurs several times in Matthew's gospel account to indicate behavior which is generally pleasing to the Lord. You see, it all starts and ends with Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, the narrow gate is not, as so often assumed, doctrinal correctness. The narrow gate is obedience to Jesus Christ. The narrow gate is the confidence in Jesus to help us to even achieve obedience. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. We, we can see that it's not doctrinal correctness because many people who cannot even understand all the, you know, correct doctrinal, you know, theological doctrines, nevertheless, they simply follow Jesus with their whole heart and their life reflects Christ likeness. Moreover, we find some people who seem to have all of the answers, who are correct doctrinally, but have their hearts full of hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness. The fruit of the good tree is obedience, which comes only from the kind of person we have become, the inside of the tree, in fellowship with Jesus. And in contrast, now changing imagery, the wolf in sheep's clothing is the one who tries to fake discipleship by trying some outward deed, but then quickly fails because what's on the inside eventually collapses. Or another way of putting it, Jesus warns us against those who would mislead us, those who look good and reasonable, but inwardly, where we know the real motivation lies, is governed by merely their own selfish desires. Outwardly, they look like sheep, but inwardly, they're only thinking about eating sheep, that is, using us for their purposes. We, on the other hand, are to produce the fruit of Christ-likeness in our lives. So how? How do you do all of this stuff? Let me read the passage again, this time from Eugene Peterson's wonderful paraphrase from the message. Don't look for short guts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, surefire easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Be wary of false preachers who smile a lot, dripping with practiced sincerity. Chances are they're only out to rip, off some, some, rip you off some way or another. Don't be impressed with charisma, look for character. Who preachers are is the main thing, not what they say. A genuine leader will never exploit your emotions or your pocketbook. These diseased trees with their bad apples are going to be chopped down and burned. Now, I am reminded again and again how much I need the power of the Holy Spirit to help me as a 
preacher. How do you do all of this stuff? I'm thinking, again, because it's the first week of school, to all of those students who have happily made their way back to school this past week. If I am to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, a student of Jesus, there is one absolute essential condition. I must be with the teacher. And this is true of all students and is precisely what is meant to follow Jesus 2,000 years ago. To follow Jesus meant, in the first place, to be with him. If you and I are followers of Jesus today, that means you and I are to be with him, to learn how to be like him. And in John chapter 14, Jesus tells his friends that he would be soon be taken away. Of course, he's on his way to the cross. However, he promises at the same time the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 says this, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. And the word that Jesus uses for spirit is parakleton in the original Greek. It means the one who is called alongside to help, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. And so God has not left us alone to figure this out. He has not left us powerless even to try a bit harder. He has graciously poured out his Holy Spirit upon you and me. And your mission, if you choose to accept it or not, is to call out again and again for the helper, the Holy Spirit of God. And something magnificent happens when you do that. Jesus comes alongside you and produces change and life in you. And let me point out one obvious way he comes alongside you. Through the daily practice of reading your Bible. And as we do that, we learn how to live our life as if Jesus was living his life through us. Or the question that we posed last week, how would Jesus live your life if he were you today? We need the Holy Spirit of God. So shall we spend a moment and ask for the helper to come? We have a God who longs to come alongside us, to have daily, moment-by-moment interaction with you and me. Why? Because he loves you so very much. Let's pray. Father, again, I thank you for my friends right now. We thank you, Lord, for calling us to your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his precious gift of life given to us through his death, through his resurrection, and through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so now, Lord, we call upon the power of the Holy Spirit to help us set our hearts and our minds on things above. Help us, Lord, to to go through the narrow way, to walk continuously in the narrow way, following our master, following our teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley, Bishop Dan, Bishop Charlie, and all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service especially Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, our Premier. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, I would invite you to offer intercessions of your own, and then I will lead us in further prayer. We want to thank you this week, Lord, for the many great blessings that you have granted to us. We thank you for the freedom of religion that, that we enjoy here in Canada that allows us to worship you without fear of persecution. We thank you as well for the abundance of, of food and in other material provisions here, Lord. We know that, that there are many in, in our community and in the surrounding area who do struggle to make ends meet, but that is not due to a lack of resources here, Lord. Help us to be thankful for what we have and to share what we have with those who need it. We thank you as well for the fellowship of the church, for the holy friendships that encourage us and spur us on to greater holiness. And with all these things in mind, Lord, we ask that you would send us out. Make us agents of your great commission who share the word of truth, the word of justice, the word of mercy with, with humility and power. We ask, Lord, that we'd have the great privilege of seeing other people come into the kingdom of light that we would have the joy of praising you along with them as we look forward to an eternity of fellowship in the communion of saints. With all these prayers and praises in mind, Lord, we just want to thank you once again for everything that we have. And we pray once again as a congregation united in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you 
and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.